Historical Society, where I where I currently work in the uh, Special Collections Department. Uh, I'm a native of Dayton, Ohio, but I have uh, deep Kentucky roots. Uh, I've been a resident of Kentucky since 1985, when I began working at the uh, Kentucky State Archives in Frankfurt, where I supervised the, the archives research room from 1985 to 2008, retired and then joined the Filson in 2013. And of course, part of the job requirements of the Filson are, are giving public presentations. And I usually, usually look for something that is a little controversial, but also a little bit timely. And as we've all witnessed in the past few years, uh, the nation once again is experiencing a lot of uh, hostility against immigrants. And essentially, you know, Bloody Monday, one of the great tragedies in Louisville's history, was a sad chapter in really the first major wave of anti immigrant hostility and hysteria in American history. But I told this to Steve, and I told this to uh, the German club when I addressed them, and I also uh, at one of our Filson programs in our auditorium. What I'm going to do is play devil's advocate. And what I mean by that is it's not just going to be the horns. It's going to be the fork tail and cloven hook. And I'm going to try to give everyone an idea or an understanding of the perception from the side of the know nothings. And at the same time, uh, re examine George D. Prentice's role uh, in a little bit more in depth uh, than it has been in the past. You know, one of the biggest challenges for historians has something to do with what I call backshadowing. And what I mean by that, so I'll just give you some examples. You know, in World War II, a young naval officer about to set out for the Pacific wrote a letter to his son. And he told him to be mind his mother, be a good student, go to church, and be a good Catholic. And that young officer was later killed in action. And that letter, as we would say in these times, went viral. And it really was a major patriotic uh, weapon to uh, you know, support the war effort during the Second World War. Yet, about 18 years after that letter was published, another young naval veteran of the war in the Pacific was running for president of the United States. But there was an element in American society that was very concerned because John F. Kennedy was Roman Catholic. So think of it. All the sacrifices, all the courage and dedication that America's Catholic community made to the war effort, despite all that, there were still these murmurs, these questions and worries. And the same thing happened in the 1920s when the uh, new Ku Klux Klan uh, arose, the rebirth of the old Klan. However, instead of the hostility against African Americans, it included immigrants and it, Catholics, Jews, and so forth despite the fact that America's Catholic community had contributed and sacrificed to the American war effort in the First World War. And in the 1890s, the American Protective Association arose when immigration peaked again at that time, though largely from, from Eastern and Southern Europe. And once again, a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment in Kentucky and the United States, even though uh, America's Roman Catholic community, at, and again, many of them immigrants at that particular time, uh, contributed to, well, in reality, they contributed to both the Union war effort and the Confederate war effort. So this has been a long, slow, you know, painful process. And for other people, other elements of our community, of course, now we see that they are experiencing a lot of the same uh, trials and tribulations. What I try to do though, when I refer to backshadowing, we're, we often view the past through what we've experienced in our own lives. And of course, what our parents told about what they experienced in World War II or our grandparents in World War I. And I wanna to try to focus solely on the hearts and minds and viewpoints of Americans 
and we'll, we'll say for the sake of argument, native born Americans in the 1840s and 1850s. And one thing that needs to, we need to be reminded about is even at that time in the 19th century, there was still sort of a, for want of a better description, a cold war between the Catholic nations of Europe and the Protestant nations of Europe. I mean, you were, they were still regarded in that light. Uh, it dates, no surprise, all the way back to the time of the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. And particularly when you consider England, uh, of course, which had a major influence on uh, American culture from the time of the first colonies forward, you know, Americans were just as proud of, for instance, uh, Queen Elizabeth's victory over the Spanish Armada. And that wasn't just a David and Goliath story of a small, tiny European nation vanquishing a superpower, Spain, in naval battles. It was, in the eyes of the English at that time, it was a victory of Protestantism over Catholicism. And of course, many are familiar with Guy Fawkes Day, which is still celebrated in England. Of course, this was a attempt in 1605 by uh, Catholic, Roman Catholic plotters to detonate uh, a huge supply of gunpowder underneath the houses of parliament. And not only would they, were they attempting to wipe out parliament, but when the king would have been addressing parliament at that time. So, Guy Fox became the great villain. And when Guy Fox Day was first celebrated and from the 17th century forward into the 18th century and even into the early 19th century, you would have bonfires. You would have images of Guy Fox uh, dressed up and paraded around the city. And you would also have images of the Pope. So when we talk about the know nothings, we would hear a cry that would be unfortunately part of the American scene all the way in the 1920s, America for Americans, but you would also hear no popery. And that dates all the way back to the, to the era of Guy Fox. And as a matter of fact, Guy Fox Day was transplanted to the colonies. And even as late as the 1880s and 1890s in New England, small villages, rural villages, still celebrated what they called as Pope Day. And again, the bonfires, the images of Fox, the images of, of the Pope, and of course, the images uh, would be tossed into the bonfire and burned, you know. The English Civil Wars were also largely uh, a result of Catholic versus Protestant uh, viewpoints or struggles in England at that time. And this was very much on the mind of the founding fathers when they you know first uh laid down some of our basic uh, governmental elements you know such as again the, the separation of church and state and so forth and of course in 1780 in england the, the great gordon lot riots occurred uh which caused a lot of property damage and damage rather and extensive uh fires in london and what was the cause of that Parliament had voted to ease restrictions on the British Catholic community. So there was this background that, you know, again, was not too far distant from the mind of, you know, Protestant America at this particular time in history. And what else we need to factor in is the age of revolution, because as we know, it began in 1776, but it did not end there. Thomas Paine hoped that the American Revolution would light fires of freedom in Europe. And of course, the French Revolution would follow. And in 1848, you had revolutions breaking out throughout Europe and Italy and modern day Germany, uh, Austria and Hungary. Uh, nationalist movements, uh, liberation movements, uh, Nationalist heroes like Giuseppe Garibaldi of modern, what we now call Italy, and Louis Kossuth in Hungary were lionized in the United States. They were spreading uh, Republican institutions and democracies in Europe. Who were the great foes of these revolutionary leaders? The crown heads of Catholic France, 
in Catholic Austria, and who also spoke out against the revolutionary fervor in Europe in this time, in the late 1840s and early 1850s, and it would be Pope Pius IX. And it's understandable. Pope Pius, as a young man, witnessed the horrors of the French Revolution, the attacks against the established church, the attacks against members of the clergy, uh, the destruction of shrines and cathedrals. And he regarded any type of rebellion against a crowned head, again, the crowned head to help defend the Vatican and the papal states in central, in central Italy as a threat against the church. But some of the views that he firmly believed in and with Jesuit support would not set well with Americans. For instance, Garibaldi took Rome in 1848 and established the Republic of Rome. He established freedom of the press, secular education, land distribution to the peasants, and for the first time in centuries, the Jews were permitted to leave their ghetto. Uh, Pius left the city, fled the city, I should say, and with the backing of, to the eyes of the Italian nationalists, foreign armies returned and brought an end to the Roman Republic in pretty swift order. So freedom of the press was abolished, freedom of speech was abolished, freedom of religion was abolished, and the Jews were forced to go back into the ghetto. Agnes McGann, Sister Agnes McGann, I should say, wrote probably the only history of the Know Nothing movement in Kentucky to date, book length study. It was published in 1940, and we desperately need another one. But one of the questions she had at the end of her book, was, why were so many prominent Americans uh, drawn into the Know Nothing movement? And when we talk about Kentucky, we're talking about Senator John J. Crittenden, who was Henry Clay's uh, right-hand man and chief lieutenant. Uh, Governor Charles Moorhead, whose wife happened to be Catholic, uh, was an outspoken uh, defender of, well, I should use the proper term for the party, the Native American Party. Uh, the future Chief Justice, John Marshall Harlan, and his father, both of Frankfurt, were members of the Native American Party. And my perspective on this is that it relates to, again, the church's stance uh, in the revolutions that took place within a short amount of time of Bloody Monday in Europe. So in the eyes of the faithful, Pius IX was defender of the faith, but to the Italian nationalists, Hungarian nationalists, German nationalists, at, well, as a matter of fact, at the time of his death, many, many years later, uh, Italian nationalists referred to him as the last medieval pope. So that gives you an idea, again, of these, these uh, conflicting viewpoints of the pontiff at this particular time. Now, at the same time of this revolutionary fervor, as we all know, there, was, there were terrible famines in Ireland. Uh, the revolutionary period in Europe led to a spike in immigration from Germany and uh, other European nations. So between 1836 and 1845, about 78,000 immigrants arrived in the United States annually. Between 1846 and 1844, 314,000 immigrants arrived in the United States annually. And the peak years, and we have to remember, Bloody Monday took place in 1855. The peak years took place between 1850 and 1854. Between 1845 and 1855, over 1.5 million immigrants, mostly Catholic, arrived from Ireland alone. And so the immigrant population, primarily German and Irish, in Louisville skyrocketed. In 1850, the immigrant population totaled 11,000 out of a total Louisville population of a little over 36,000. So, 
for the first time in its history, Americans were dealing with mass, like a tsunami of immigrants coming into the country. And because Americans regarded their country as a Protestant nation, you know, this led to the type of anti-immigrant hysteria that would give birth to the Native American party. Uh, it was strong uh, throughout the nation, particularly in states like Massachusetts, uh, cities like New Orleans, uh, and again, cities like Louisville, Kentucky, for instance. And at the same time, we have the Mexican War taking place from 1846 to 1848. Now, thousands of Irish and German immigrants served in the United States Army. There are, were at least two companies of German immigrants in the Louisville Legion that fought bravely on the battlefields of Mexico. But human nature being what it is, what do you think many Americans remembered most? The sacrifice and the courage of those immigrants, those Catholic immigrants, or the fact that the Mexican government lured Catholics from the ranks of the American army to desert? Because their argument was, why are you fighting for a Protestant nation against a Catholic nation, against your Catholic brothers. So enough Irish deserted to form the famous uh, San Patricio or St. Patrick's Battalion, a full battalion of Irishmen that deserted the American army and fought against the American army in the Mexican war. So all of these factors are all roiling the surface in the background. So in 1855, we have the state elections in August. And so the drumbeat, the political drumbeat begins early in that particular year. What's interesting is, is that George Dennison Prentice, a native of Connecticut, who came to Kentucky in the 1830s to write a bi campaign biography of Henry Clay, to stay on as the editor of one of Henry Clay's most important newspaper, Whig organs, Whig Party organs, the Louisville Daily Journal, was not initially willing to jump on to the Know Nothing bandwagon. As a matter of fact, Walter Haldeman of the Louisville Daily Courier, also a Whig paper, but a more of a pro-slavery Whig paper, was the mouthpiece for the Native American Party in Kentucky since about 1844. So when the election began to go into high gear and the Know Nothing Party in Kentucky wanted an official masthead newspaper. They chose Prentice. And Haldeman was so disgusted because he felt he deserved to be the flagship editor that he left the party. And almost overnight, he became an anti Know Nothing newspaper editor in the city of Louisville. And the press was where we first began to see a war of words as opposed to outright clashes uh, on the streets of Will at that time. Uh, Prentice's, one of his assistant editors was Caleb Logan. And even though most people believe that Prentice was writing anti-Catholic uh, editorials and debating Benedict J. Webb, who was the leading Catholic newspaper man in Louisville, it was actually Caleb Logan, but Prentice was senior editor, and nothing went into that paper that he didn't approve of. So Caleb Logan, a, a Whig attorney in Louisville, and Benedict J. J. Webb dueled uh, in the press from early 1855 and throughout the summer all the way up to the election. Bishop Martin J. Spaulding also participated in the War of Words with Samuel F. Morse. Uh, yes, Samuel F. Morse, uh, Telegraph and all that sort of thing, who was a rabid uh, nativist at this particular time, and he and Martin J. Spaulding uh, dueled in the national press. The Reverend Samuel Howard Ford of Louisville, a Protestant minister, also dueled with Bishop Spaulding in the Louisville press over, again, the so-called popish thread. Now, I want to emphasize that what I've discovered is it's not as much 
anti-Catholicism is that old, worn out, bloody shirt that dated back to the 17th century, no popery. So this was really still the main drumbeat in the nativist press, including in Louisville. What was Prince saying at this particular time? And this really, to my view anyway, puts him in a, a little bit of a different light. He believed that the freedoms for Louisville Catholics and all Catholics really in the United States should be protected. His primary concerns were about the role of the Vatican in American elections and, you know, the impact that, uh, you know, given events in Europe, that that might have on American elections. He espoused religious freedom for all Americans. He even at one point said that he not only included Roman Catholics in this regard, but Muslims, Jews, and pagans. So this was being printed in the Louisville Journal. In July, he began to express serious concerns about the possibility of violence at the polls, and we'll get to what elections were like in those days in just a few seconds here. He stated that anyone who engaged in violence on either side, either the Democratic Party, which was, again, pro-immigrant, or the Native American Party, should be hanged on the spot. He also suggested that both parties in Louisville form a bipartisan group of poll guardsmen that would help work together to prevent violence at the polls. And in July, when a group of nativist thugs attacked Irish Catholics on the street and entered and invaded a Roman Catholic church and caused some damage, he condemned these attacks and stated that uh, if they caught the perpetrators, they should be prosecuted to the full extent of the laws. He urged more polling places to be established yeah. so that that might reduce the elimination of violence. And Mayor John Barbie, who happened to be a know-nothing, uh, as well as the chief of police and many other uh, city officials in this time, did go and beef up the police force. Now, elections in 19th century America were a male contact sport. This is before football and rugby. And this is the era beginning with the Jacksonian era in the 1830s of brass knuckle politics. So if you haven't seen it already, watch Martin Scorsese's Gangs of New York. It deals with the nativist movements and riots in New York City at the very same time. And it clearly shows what election days were like. It depend, didn't make any difference whether you were an immigrant or a know-nothing. If you went to the polls, both parties would hire thugs and rowdies who would be standing along the side of the street and, where are you going today, sir? Uh, who do you plan to vote for? And of course, if they were know-nothing thugs and you said that I'm going to vote the Democratic ticket, you got a pretty good beating. Sometimes on the way to the polls, sometimes on the way back from the polls. So on the day of the election in Louisville in August, that fateful day, there was considerable thuggery going on around the polling places as Prentice feared. Something else that needs to be bore in mind that because voting was a male, uh, was an expression of masculinity at that time, Newspapers use martial language. Uh, if you look at the Louisville Daily Journal at this time, if you look at the Louisville Daily Democrat and the Louisville Daily Courier, which of course, both of those were anti know nothing newspapers, you would see images of cannons firing, uh, of soldiers firing their muskets, uh, go to the polls and fight you know, for your party, fight for your country. Uh, you know, the battle is at hand. This was very typical. So technically speaking, there wasn't anything inflammatory in the Louisville Daily Journal that had not been printed in every election cycle all the way back to when the paper was founded in 1830. But what Prentice and other journalists fail to realize, there's a difference between using that kind of language and that kind of imagery when you're talking about your, quote, 
American neighbors who happen to be Jacksonians or again, looking from the other side of the political aisle, happened to be Henry Clay supporters, then people that had been, being, that were being demonized as a foreign threat and a sinister, um, part of a sinister conspiracy from old Europe to undermine uh, American Republic, Republican, inst little r, institutions and virtues. So the most famous thing that was appeared in the Louisville Journal uh, election issue, uh, and I sort of paraphrase here, Americans, are you ready to go to the polls? We hope you are. Fire away and give no mercy to the foe. This would come back to haunt him, not only for the rest of his life, but in, this would be a staple in Louisville history in all parts of uh, anything that had to do with with Bloody Monday and the aftermath. But when you look at the election issue, now in those days, you didn't have big banner headlines. So on page three of a four page newspaper, Prentice's newspaper, there are columns of what were known as little squibs, little one and two sentence, you know, lines that went down the page. And halfway down the page was this particular little squib. So it wasn't like part of an editorial. Uh, it wasn't at the masthead. But this particular squib would come back to haunt him. Something else I've noted, and I, I'll say up front, uh, you know, further research needs to be noted, or need to be done, I'm sorry, uh, as far as the origins of the violence. But what I've been able to find in going through the newspapers, the journal, the Democrat and the Courier, is that what started, or what, I'm sorry, what transformed your usual broken nose, uh, broken head election day violence in American society at that time into a bloody riot began near Quinn's Row, where a large number of Irish lived in Louisville. And three Native Americans had gotten off work. Uh, they worked on the riverfront. They were walking to the polls. It was late in the afternoon and the election was already highly in favor of the Native American candidates. This would be the gubernatorial candidates, Charles Moorhead, for instance. And as they walked down in front of Quinn's Row, an Irishman stepped out of that building and not even an Irishman from Louisville, but an Irishman from New Orleans who was in the city having come up the river to work and probably was planning to leave the city fairly soon. He walked up to one of them and you could tell him no nothing because they wore yellow tags in their hats or in their vest or in their shirt pockets. And he shot one of these uh, local Native Americans in the back of the head and killed him. When this man sprawled dead in front of Quinn's Row, one of his companions knelt down to render him aid, and the Irishman shot him and killed him. Now, human nature being what it is, as word spreads through the city of these two killings, what do you think? How do you think it was being described? A lone Irishman, uh, a crackpot, killed two Native Americans? No. The Irishman. Irish are killing Americans. So everyone in the Native American camp went to their homes, armed themselves, and swarmed to Quinn's Row. The Irish inhabitants of Quinn Row, again, and this really underscores the tragedy of Bloody Monday, what are they going to think? You know, they think that the Americans are there to attack them because they were immigrants. Well, they fired into the Americans, the Americans fired back, casualties on both sides. Uh, the Americans rolled up, they, uh, no nothings rolled up a cannon because the, the local uh, militia companies were all Native American. And fortunately, no one fired that artillery piece into Quinn's Road, but it was burned to the ground and a number of people lost their lives in this particular aspect of the tragedy and the violence would spread throughout the city and members of the German community were also attacked.
Prentice did not show himself in front of Quinn's row. He did not stand in front of the journal office or the courthouse and continue to whip up frenzy. Rather, he was speaking out against the violence, as was Mayor Barbie at this particular time. And so he was doing whatever he could to get the mobs, the Native American mobs, to cease and desist. But again, uh, the tragedy would go well into the night with lives lost on both sides. So this, more than anything else, shows the complexity and the tragedy of Bloody Monday. Things aren't always, you know, I think Americans in particular, uh, I was watching Van Jones of CNN uh, when they aired their documentary on uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, earlier this year. And he said, Americans, it seems like more than any people seem to, you know, you have to be either 100% a saint or 100% a sinner. And we have difficulty, you know, dealing with historical complexities and nuances, uh, things of that nature with our past. But in this particular instance, you know, I feel that and I intend to look into this further, that Prentice wasn't quite the devil that he was made out to be. Now, that doesn't excuse the, you know, the death and destruction that, that occurred that day. But there were many other contributing factors that have not been addressed in the historical community in the past that really bring the picture, at least in my opinion, into a, a clearer focus. And before I lose the thought, um, anyone who was uh, sort of spreading the anger and hate on the streets on election day were like the Native American ward bosses and election bosses. And to a certain extent, the Native American candidate for Congress, uh, Humphrey Marshall, who was a uh, recognized Mexican war hero and a, a virulent uh, anti-Catholic and anti-immigrant uh, in individual. And he was very outspoken and his language was very militant in his speeches in Louisville to people on the street. So I think there are others that uh, among that party that uh, do deserve censure for their, their words and acts on that particular tragic Monday. So this is probably an all too brief overview of Prentice's role in Bloody Monday, but I'd be happy at this point to, to yield the floor to Steve. Uh, if, any, if Steve or anyone else here today has any questions, I'd be happy to do my best to answer them. If I don't have an answer for you, uh, contact me at the Filson. Uh, you can find my email address on the staff roster, and I'd be happy to do you know some additional digging for you or probably provide additional information. And again, thank you for the opportunity of visiting with you today. Well, thank you, Jim. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, this is Steve. And uh, if anyone has any questions, you, you will need to unmute yourself since most of you are muted. So just uh, go on to your, uh, your name there and unmute yourself. If you have any questions, I'll open up the floor now. Jim, this is Drew Schrock. And I have several questions. Yes. Is there ever been an estimate on the number of people who were killed? And also, can you touch upon where the rioting happened? I know it happened on Main Street, I think like between 9th and 12th Street. Was that known as Quinn's Row back then? I'd heard one time that they had gone into the Cathedral of the Assumption. I think yes. it was no nothing because they thought they were housing. Uh, there was a cache there. of weapons there. And again, that gives you the, the and we've seen this just recently, this paranoia that, you know, uh, these immigrants represent sinister, sinister forces. So obviously uh, the Cathedral of the Assumption, uh, the cellar or basement, whatever you, wherever you wish, uh, there were stockpiled weapons for uh, the immigrant uprising. And the mayor was really the uh, hero in this particular instance. And I should also say that Bishop Spaulding, you know, at one point, um, some know-nothing 
political leaders showed up in one area of town and, you know, for the purpose of, of quelling the violence. And, and I suspect these Germans were Mexican war veterans because they fired a volley over, over the top of the buggy. And of course the, uh, the know nothings uh, turned that buggy around and, and left pretty quickly. But um, again, Bishop Spalding was out there on the streets trying to bring it into the violence and uh, also the mayor and some of the militia officers as well. But, you know, I apologize. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a little bit travel worn. Plus, uh, you know, I got back from my, my reunion last night, but on the way home, I stopped and gave uh, an in-person lecture in Lexington. And I forgot as I was setting up for today to bring the map that I use for this talk that shows other areas of the city that were affected by the violence. But some of you who may be, uh, you know, experts in local German history, who might know some of the areas of the city where, you know, the German community was predominated. I do know that a, a German brewery was, if I remember correctly, burned to the ground. But my impression is at this point has been that, that it, it was the Irish community that evidently bore the brunt of the violence and, and suffered the most casualties. Other questions, uh, Drew, uh, any other questions on that or follow-ups? No, I had heard that uh, it was basically, I think maybe St. Joseph or St. Martin de Tours on Shelby Street. I think that was that came under attack. I remember reading in the Courage Journal about 20 years ago when they were doing a renovation there and they had taken a cross down at St. Martin de Tours and they found actual um, bullet, I guess you want to call it bullet casings in there or bullet bullets in there. And they think that's because they were shooting at that cross during the riot. Mm -hmm. I do know that some of that rioting did take place at where it's currently Baxter Avenue and Lexington Road. I think that might have been the brewery. I can't, someone who's better well versed in German history might be able to know that. But I think that, that rioting took place down there at Lexington and Baxter, that they were setting some places on fire and shooting people as they try to jump out of their windows to escape. From yeah, that, that was definitely the case at uh, Quinn's Row. And as a matter of fact, uh, Mr. Quinn himself uh, was shot down and killed as he tried to flee from, from that particular row of dwellings. And, and I should explain something else just very quickly. Uh, I turned 68 on May 4th and my latest birthday present is losing the hearing in this year. So if you see me cut my ear while I'm just trying to give myself a little, uh, little bit of extra aid before, while I save up to get a hearing aid. <laughs> Any other uh, questions uh, from anyone out there? Uh, you have to unmute yourself if you have any questions. <laughs> 